Uh, I uh, began interacting with John uh, after he became interested in random matrix theory and integrable systems, and this has been very much to my benefit. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm uh, speaking today about uh, what's called the open Toda chain with external forcing, and this is joint work uh, together with Lu and Chao Li. Herbert Spohn, Carlos Tomé, and Thomas Trogdon. It's a, it's a, it's a COVID piece of work because I'm in New York, Lou and Chow is in Pennsylvania, Herbert Spohn is in Munich, Carlos Tomé is in uh, Rio, and Tom Trogdon is in at the University of Washington. So, and an early version of the uh, paper paper can be found on the archive where you can see the reference uh, below that. So there is a theme for the talk and it goes like this. It's called the, uh, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. So you'll see why I have chosen this. Uh, people who remember back to the 1950s, we'll know that this was also used in a political con con context, which uh, may or may not explain if people ask. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, in 1967, Toda introduced the e e eponymous to Toda system with the Hamiltonian, as I have it written down there. So this is for an infinite set of particles of equal mass on the line. And there are exponential forces and there are also linear forces. The Qs are the positions of the particle and the Ps are the momenta. The corresponding Hamiltonian equations have the form Q dot equals the H dot EP, P dot equals minus the H by the Q. And uh, for any fi finite n, the equations take the form three. And um, this, can I point to this? this no, that one. Okay. Uh, and uh, so you get the equation three, the se second order equation for the Qs. And then after you scale both the uh, positions and the time, the equations take the form four, which is more familiar perhaps, and uh, which are generated by a Hamiltonian of the form five, uh, where C is any constant. The restriction to periodic conditions, boundary conditions, Qn plus capital N equals Qn plus some S, Pn plus N equals Pn, where S is equal to the sum of the difference of the Qn's was in, investigated first numerically and then analytically, culminating in the proof by Anon and shortly thereafter by Flaschke and independently Manakov that the periodic system was integrable. The so-called open Toda chain, also called Toda with fixed ends, is the finite n-dimensional system that remains after setting a Q0 to fixing it at minus infinity and Qn plus 1, fixing it at plus infinity, so you get a system of degree capital N, and the equations look like six q n dot equals p n p and q uh, these are the familiar the familiar open total equations which are generated by the hamiltonian h f q p which is familiar i'm sure to everybody here uh, motivated by their approach to the periodic case flaschke and manikov showed that six the equation to the top there could be written in lax pair form where you introduced a n to be minus a half of the momenta and the b n's are uh, the essentially the exponential of the differences of the q n's and then in this extraordinary observation uh, of Plushkin and Man Manikov they introduced the lax so-called lax operator l a trida a jacobi matrix where the A is down the diagonal, the B is on the off diagonal, and B is a skew symmetric matrix obtained by taking the lower part of L and then flipping it up with a minus sign to the upper triangular part. Then, as we all know, the equations for QN and PN, these equations over here, equation six, then take the lax pair form where L dot is the commutative LF and BF, 
And the initial conditions uh, can be read off from the initial Q's and P's. You just plug them into seven to get your initial conditions. And uh, uh, that's the equation. So any system of the form eight has the property that necessarily the eigenvalues of L are conserved. And so they're going to give you N constant of the motion. Uh, this is uh, Vax's brilliant idea where people were trying to understand K, KDB and he wanted to give an abstract way of thinking about how you could possibly have a system which would have a lot of integrals. And he introduced, uh, so I believe uh, he introduced this as a notion, an abstract notion, without uh, knowing what L and P should be in the case of K, KDB. And only when uh, Kron Kreskel came to Courant and gave a lecture and began speaking about his in inverse scattering theory. It Lex immediately saw that's the L he should choose, and it's history after that, right? So uh, uh, what one needs to know, of course, is not just that the eigenvalues are conserved quant quantities, but you also want to know that they possibly commute with each other so that you can show, and so hence the system is real integrable. Now, subsequently, in very important work, Jürgen Moser showed how to use the equation eight, the Lax pair form, to solve the equation six, these equations at the top there, uh, in terms of rational functions of exponentials. Uh, furthermore, Moser showed that the system has the following remarkable long term scattering the, the behavior. So uh, the QNs are uh, asymptotically evolving linearly in time with a velocity given by a n plus or minus, depending whether you're going to plus or minus infinity, a shift beta n, and then a error of, order, of exponentially small order. Uh, there's a typo on the PNs. It should, it should just be alpha n plus. The T should, shouldn't be there, but plus an exponentially small term. And the a n pluses, these asymptotic velocities, uh, could be expressed or were, were expressed explicitly in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix, which are, of course, conserved. And then uh, uh, he computed explicitly the scattering shift. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time say, saying something about that. But he computed it explicitly. And so what you see, if you take in equation 11, you take little n to be 1. So you get beta 1 plus, And you take from that beta minus n. So particle 1 and particle capital N are related in this way, that the velocity of particle 1 at minus infinity is then converted into the velocity of the particle n as you go to plus infinity, but there's a shift. And uh, you can think about this, you know, the image you should have is imagine you have a lot of little iron balls attached to a string, and you've got a lot of them coming down one after the other, then you take the first one here and you just let it go and bangs into this and its velocity is picked up by the last one. So that's how an amazing way the total system acts. But he was able to compute the shift. So particle one transmits its velocity to particle n at infinity, but there's a shift. And the shift is given by this explicit formula. Now, so uh, as I'm saying here, more and more generally, the velocity of the particle Q, capital N minus little n plus one at T goes to minus infinity is then transferred to particle Q little n at T equals plus infinity with this kind of shift. So when I came across this formula here, uh, I was really astounded because uh, in my background at that point, I'd been working uh, on abstract sc scattering theory of the type uh, if you've got a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, for example, and you wanted to prove that the scattering was complete, that the scattering matrix was unitary, thing, things like that. It was things going on in, uh, in fun uh, functional analysis, really, and you just wanted to prove the existence of, so you didn't compute anything. 
So the idea that you could actually compute the scattering matrix for a system of n particles was absolutely astounding to me. I, I hadn't seen anything like it. Everything I'd seen before was abstracted. And so I asked Moza how it was possible that you could compute it explicitly. And then his answer was somewhat mysterious. He said the following, every scattering system is integrable. It took me some time to understand what he was saying, but suppose we were in R2n, uh, just as we are for the total to system, the, the positions are QT and the momentum are PT. And you know that uh, under your Hamiltonian, that as T goes to, to infinity, PT begins to converge to a constant and QT begins to move linearly in time with some constants, Q infinity and P, P infinity. So you let UT of Q0, P0 be the solution of the system with that initial data. And you let UT super zero with some initial data be the solution of the free particle system. So that's H0 equals P squared over two. The solution of the free, free system is written in the middle there, P0 of T equals P0 zero. Q0 of T is a constant plus P zero T. And now what you should compute is the composition of UT, which is a solution of the full interacting system together with the free system. So UT will give you what's written at the top there, PT uh, equals P infinity plus, and QT is Q infinity plus T P infinity plus a little bit. So you plug that in there into the first line over here. And then what you do is you let it act on, you let U0 minus T act on it. So you take that. And then the T dependence, uh, the le leading order T, T dependence uh, drops out. And you see that as T gets large, this is just going to converge to some quantity. So in other words, the composition of U0 minus T and UT converges, and that's the wave operator. If you just remember that UT is a group, UT plus S equals UT uh, composed with US, and you just write it down as I have written down on the top there. And then you, in that relationship, you let T go to, to infinity, what you just have that the wave operator W composed with US is equal to U0 of S composed with W. And then you remember that because you're dealing with Hamiltonian systems, UT and U0 of minus T are symplectic. So the composition is symplectic and hence in the limit, it is sim symplectic. And uh, they have determinant one, each one has determinant one. So W, the limit will also be in, in, invertible and uh, uh, w inverse will, will exist, and hence you obtain equation 12, which says that US is symplectically equivalent to U0 of S, which means that U of S is a completely integrable system. And you can take the integrals, alpha 1 to alpha n, they're computing integrals for the free, free, free system H0. And you just define beta i to be the alpha i composed with w. And then you just look at this line over here. So beta i composed with the solution of the full system. And for the full system, you plug in beta i is equal to alpha i composed with w, composed with ut. Then you use uh, the relationship 12, and you see it's really alpha i on the free free system. So these are constants of the motion. And because W is symplectic, the Poisson bracket of the beta i's is the just uh, the image of the Poisson bracket of the alpha i's composed with W, which are zero. So these are then, com it's a completely integrable system. Said differently, the above calculation shows it more generally that if a system behaves like an integrable system, then it is an integrable system. Or in other words, it's the famous duck test that if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it talks like that, actually it is a duck. 
remembering back to Moses' long time, long time estimates, going back to here, under nine. So you see, it looks like a free, a free system, and hence, by Moses' argument, it is a free. It, it's a, it is an integrable system. So, um, so some remarks uh, from this duck test. The, we learn that there is a very interesting catch-22 in the problem. Uh, and the catch-22 says, says the following. You say, look, I don't care about integral methods. I don't, I don't want to think about it. I just want to use a hands-on approach, maybe some dynamical system ideas. And I then want to compute the long-time B, B, B behavior of the system. What you learn from this, you would not have been able by any means to have computed the long time behavior if the problem would not have been integrable in the first place. It's a catch 22 in the whole business. Now, Moses' argument can be used to prove integrability of a variety of systems. For example, Moses' proof of the integrability of the charge particle in the dipole field. This is the so called Stormer, Stormer problem. In another direction, uh, with Jin, Jin Zhou, we showed contrary to many people's expectation that the perturbed defocusing NLS equation on, on the line, so that's equation 14, uh, with a, a uh, perturbation parameter epsilon, this is integrable. Uh, for any epsilon less than some epsilon zero here, as long as k of q squared goes to zero as q goes to zero faster than a power of two. But it remains integrable no matter what you put in there. Just sub subject to these, uh, uh, these uh, cr uh, criteria. Now, in this talk, I want to consider Toda's original system. So going back here, this system now, uh, in the case, uh, where we have a fi finite number of particles. So we're going to be looking at this. This is the mm -hmm. system here, but now it differs from the open total or the standard, but because there is this extra term, which is C plus the sum of the differences of the Qs. And the equations of motion are given by 15, which are very similar to the open case, except the C is non-zero. And you notice that C times the sum is really C of Q1 minus Qn. And we can think of HC as the Hamiltonian of a lattice of particles 1 to n with external for forces acting on the endpoints via this potential. For example, if you compute the force on the first particle, it's minus d by dq1 of this difference, and it gets minus c. And the force on the last particle is minus d by the n of c which is just C, so that when C is positive, the force is pulling the particle one to the left and the particle n to the right, so you're stretching the system. Whereas if C is negative, you're compressing the system. And this particular Hamiltonian arose naturally in the study of Her Herbert Spohn, in the uh, for the st statistical mechanics of the to uh, total lattice uh, subject, which he's been working on a lot recently. So the numerical cal calculations below suggest strongly that in the case when C is positive, HC is integrable. And indeed, our main result is to show using Moses' integrability argument, the duck argument, that in this case, uh, that is, that this is the case in the case. So when C, C is positive, we're going to show that it actually is integrable. In the case when C is negative, we will argue below that the numerical calculation suggests that also in this case, there is an integrable structure or near integrable structure, but the problem remains open. So as a benchmark, I um, first want to show you the classical results on the open total layers. This is when C equals zero. So you see uh, the first uh, figure, uh, the blue dots are the initial positions, the red dots are the initial momenta. Then uh, the first uh, 
Uh, the gra graph in the middle shows how the positions evolve in time, and you see eventually they move linearly in time. And uh, the uh, bottom figure are the velocities, PT, which eventually become constant. It's always sort of a little spooky to see how the uh, momentous saw, sort themselves out and just seem to know what to do is it's it's almost anthropomorphic right here we begin to see what happens when our c is positive this is when you're stretching the lattice and you'll see over here again the first figure showed that the velocity at the initial positions of chosen ra randomly more or less and the positions are cho chosen randomly but you still see that apart from the first particle and the last particle the particles from two up to n then end up moving linearly whereas the first particle and the last particle are moving uh, quad quadratically and they're moving away from the so you should begin thinking that you've got a lattice of n, n particles, the first and the last run away and just leave you with a classical total lattice in the, in the middle. Again, you, uh, you see that if you look at the, the momenta, then the, the momenta of the first and last particle grow linearly, but uh, for the rest of the particles, they're eventually there. So this really looks a lot like a class of the open case, uh, except particles one and n are running away from you. Now, uh, so to summarize those pic pictures, if you look at the particles from two to n, n minus one, it's very much like the open lattice, whereas the first and the last are moving quad uh, quadratically. Uh, so this suggests that the solutions of HC, when C is positive, uh, behave like solutions of a system of n n particles consisting of a total lattice in the middle, particles two up to n, n minus one, and a decoupled, which is decoupled from a pair of decoupled particles just solving this very simple system in the middle. Uh, such a system of n particles clearly completely integrable in the sense which having, a, once we believe the duct test, right? What we will show is that solutions of a perturbed system with Hamiltonian HC, C positive, indeed behave asymptotically like solutions of a decoupled system. And hence, in view of Moses' observation, the perturbed system is integrable. Now, the situation is very, very different when C is negative. And I really want to present this as really a, a real challenge because uh, you'll see the results are so evocative but it's, we have absolutely no way of understanding what I'm going to show you now. So in all three cases, I'm going to throw, uh, uh, I'm going to show, show you three cases, uh, different initial data, all correspond to CE equal to my minus one, a negative value. In all three cases, you will see the solution appears to evolve almost periodically in time, modulo a slight gradient, the gradient arises from the fact that the total momentum is con conserved, which means that the center of mass, Q1 up to Qn, moves linearly. However, for some unexplained reason, all the particles come together at some periodic time. So because at these times, T1, T2 up to Tk, Q1 of Tk, Q and all, all, all all of these, Q1 of Tk, Q2 of Tk, they all become equal. So in other words, uh, the nth particle is just behaving like one over n times a, cent a center of mass. So it's moving down at these interval times, you'll see. In the first two cases, this behavior persists at least up to times t equals three, 300. But in the third case, the almost periodicity, begin, almost periodicity begins to unravel after about t equals 200. So having said this, let me just show you what it looks like. So here we take a negative value of C, 
and the uh, initial moment, uh, uh, the original moment given by the red dot, initial positions by the blue, blue dot. And here is, you look at the middle picture, you see that what is happening to the positions. The positions come together at certain periodic times, and they're lying on that uh, slight line going down as time go, goes on, which is given by the conservation of to total momentum. But it looks almost periodic. If you change your dagger a little bit, you see a similar phenomenon. Again, you see this peri or almost periodic be 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 behavior. Different figures, right? Pictures are very different. And then he has a thir third example, but you, the thing to notice about it is that whereas in the earlier cases, the, peri the periodicity uh, continues up to, certainly it's uh, the or almost periodicity seems to continue up to times three, 300, but in this last example, it begins to unravel earlier on. So this is the picture which uh, is still a total mystery to us. Can you think of any dynamical system which has the property that at certain period of time, it brings all the particles back together? Synchron there's a synchronization taking place. Can you think of a system doing this? I have no idea. Uh, so these calculations bring to mind the celebrated com computation of Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, and Singo, in which the authors anticipating erg ergodicity, let me remind you that um, the people were new to the computer, there was this understanding of uh, von Neumann that we should regard the computer as a mathematical laboratory on which you could try things and see what was actually happening into genuinely non-linear systems, which you had no chance of understanding analytically, just put it on the computer. So they thought, let me take a system of anharmonic oscillators, and what should happen if I start them off in one frequency mode, what should happen is that energy should be distributed amongst all the free, 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 or, amongst all, all the frequency modes, and you should see something ergodic coming up. And then, of course, famously, they found that there were times, almost period times, in which the system reassembled itself. Now, the way you could try to understand that was that the only way some inert object, like a dynamical system, can reconstruct itself or remember its past is if there are many integrals of the motion. That's a way. So people began thinking, wow, this system should have many, many integrals. And then, of course, this way of thinking eventually led to the understanding of the work of Preskill and his collaborators that the associated limiting system was the K KDV equation, which in fact was completely integrable. Now, uh, over the years, as the power of computers grew, it became clear that Fermi et al. had just not run their equations long enough. With longer computations, they would have found that almost periodicity unraveled and ergodicity emerged. And a very interesting understanding of uh, Fermi et al. was given recently by, Ga by Galan, Pono, and Rink, and you can find the archive reference there. And what they showed was really something really uh, very interesting. They showed that the lattice equations for unidirectional uh, lattice phase can be written schematically in the form x dot equals v of x plus something of order h squared, where well, h squared is a continuum limit parameter. And the equation y dot equals v was just k kdv. So what this means is if you run to times t, which is less than or equal to h to the minus, minus two, so that th squared is or, or, or the one, as long as you're going up to that time, and that's a time when x t can be expected to diverge from yt, thus the lattice has many h squared 
accurate integrals up to times of order h to the minus two. So it looks integrable and then it begins to un unravel. It turns out, however, that the near integrability persists for much longer times t of order h to the minus four. And this they were elegantly able to explain by showing that in fact, xt solves a system of the form x dot equals w of x plus order h to the fourth. Uh, where now y dot equals w, y is the solution of the K KDV hi hierarchy and hence also integrable. So you could run it up to times h to the minus four. So we are led to the following spare speculation. And this is what I'm really trying to bring to your attention. Um, and that is that is the Fermi et al problem a guide to what we see for C less than zero? Fermi et al raises the issue of whether there is some integrable system associated with the lattice, which describes the solution of the lattice equation to high accuracy for large times, but not infinite times. In this way, for large times, the system would have excellent, but not perfect memory. And this problem is still intriguing and open. So a remark here is that the fermi pasteur Tsingo para paradox as this called is a modern illustration of the interesting phenomena that sometimes science makes progress not because of the accuracy of its instruments, but rather because of their inaccuracy. If computers in the 1950s would have made longer calculations, would KDB have been discovered as an integrable system? If uh, it should be Taitaka Brahi here, had more accurate instruments, sensitive to fl uh, fluctuation of the planetary orbits would Kebler have been able to come up with his perfect laws. Just imagine him saying to people, well, it's sort of like ellipses. Well, would that have had the same strength, right? Okay, so we proved the integrability of HC with C uh, bigger than zero in steps. Uh, in step one, we prove that solutions of equation 15, that's the full equation. Let me just remind you again. There it is. This is the full, full system with Hamiltonian HC. Okay, so the first fact is, doesn't depend whether C is positive or, positive or negative, but it's very easy to show that you have a unique global solution for the equations. In step two, we show that as T goes to infinity, the particle system 15 splits up into two parts, a core of particles, two to n minus one, obeying the following equations. The Q and dots, they look almost like the free, the open total as except P2 dot is given by the free part plus some error term, O2 of T, and similarly for P n, n minus one. So if a O2 was zero or O n minus one was zero, you would have the open total lattice of particles two to n, n minus one. And the key technical thing is to show that O T is decaying super exponentially. So system is pulling away, these two particles, one and n are pulling away. And so uh, we have here a system of core lattice up to some small error and two decoupled particles separating from the core. So that is what one has to do. The step three is here for solutions. We obtain precise asymptotics for the inner core. So uh, is there some chalk? Uh, so if I can write this. Schematically, HC is three, n minus one and n. You've got forces between these, and you've also got these external forces. So this is with C negative. C negative, the forces go the other way when C, C is positive. And we show that, and let's say that the evolution is written as ut. Then we show that particles uh, begin to look like a system given by 18, n, n minus one, n minus two, 
two, three. Now this force here is now gone. You still have these forces and these forces, but you have decoupled one from two and N from N, N minus one. So you're left with an inner core. And here we're going to call the motion of this thing uh, U hat. The flow generated by HC is UT. The flow generated by this system is U hat. And we have a third system where you're using 18 some kind of this is uh, no, this is the actual solution. UT is the actual solution generated by HC. No, the equation 18 is kind of a parameters for the for the full solution. Yeah, it is what the solution looks like. It's it looks like the flow generated by this Hamilton, where you have disconnected the particles two to n minus one. From the uh, from particles one and particles n, and then we have a u sharp t, which is just taking these particles and has one two. This is n, n minus one. All these inner forces are now gone, and you just have the external forces like this. This is h uh, sharp. So. This is the full system. This is the system in which particles 1 and n have been decoupled from the inner core. And this is where all the particles are free and just particle 1 and particle n are acted on by these external forces. Then you prove the first wave operator exists. So you're comparing the flow of the full system you're interested in with the free system, the absolutely free system. And that limit exists. So you show that the solution of this problem here look like solutions of this one. Similarly, you show that the solutions of this one look like this one. Then you're going to get these two wave, wave operators. If you compose these two, two wave operators, you get a new wave operator W, and this operator W commutes with this flow, and that flow. So it's telling you that this flow system here, flow the full flow, behaves like this system, which is clearly completely integrable. It's an inner total, open total, total as with two other particles moving on. This proves the integrability of the system. Now, uh, uh, here we show uh, in step, uh, step five, here we show how to use W com to compute action angle variables for HC, and also how to write the equation 15 generated by HC in lax pair form. So it's not just that you prove you can show all the standard term terminology, which is connected with an integral system is appropriate here. The system has action angle variables, which you can write, write, write down in terms of these W, uh, w operators, but also you can write down a lax pair. So I just want to take a moment off to show something I learned recently, which is really a remarkable observation by Rowan Killip. Now, it may shock you as much as it sh sh shocked me, but I want to mention it. It's something which should have been proven a long time ago, and it's the following. So this is a comment by Rowan, and it's connected with the lax pair form. Okay, and it says that every Hamiltonian uh, uh, with an equilibrium point. So here's your Hamiltonian, and you know that Hx. Uh, Every Hamiltonian with the equilibrium point in R2n, and they call the points x and R2n, hx at some point is zero, has a lax pair. You've got a Hamiltonian in R2n. If it has an equilibrium point, it has a lax pair form. And it really shows you that 
just having a lax pair is of really, it's really like a invitation. It's an invitation to say, oh, there's something interesting here happening, perhaps. As every system, just with an equilibrium point, uh, has a lax pair, uh, uh, one has to put in perspective when people say, oh, I want to show that my system has got a lax pair. Well, that can, what information is going to be in there? And you've got to always append the lax pair with um, some additional information. Uh, his, I'll leave you to check the example for yourself. So first of all, without loss, and take x0 to be 0, so hx at 0 and 0. And you'll draw your equations of motions are dt of x equals the usual j operator, grad hxx. And you write hx uh, in the following way, where b of x, it's just some cal calculus, right? It's 0 to 1. Um, of px or theta x be theta. So you, this is just uh, expanding out and using the fact that this is true. And then what you should do is you should take L to be x, x transpose j. And uh, you can show that this L over here is this form dtl equals jb. Of course, there's no information in here. The eigenvalues of that matrix are all just zero. Just the fact that you say a system has a lax pair is something which you must take with a huge grain of salt. I mean, all the uh, spinning top equations uh, can be written in lax pair form, but not all of them are integrable, right? But that's a more familiar example. Of course, this condition that it should have an equilibrium point is not a necessary condition. We know the total lattice itself is a system which has a lax pair form, but it has no equilibrium points. Okay, let me just finish off by saying as a technical comment is what the key is to prove that these terms OT and ON minus one and 16, OT and ON minus one, if these terms are absent, you just have a system of N minus two open uh, to, uh, to pod, uh, particles. So you've got to prove, this is the key to prove this. And that you prove by a bootstrap argument, which goes through many steps. Uh, but the first step I want to just men, uh, mention, yeah, unfortunately, there are many ty typos here, is you've got your energy is conserved, so it's H0. This should be a capital N, that P1 minus Pn squared is bounded by that quantity, but Pn is uh, dq by dt, so you rewrite this equation like this, and you end up with this a priori bound, which telling you, which tells you basically that the particles can fall at x, q1 and q, and can move apart, but not too far apart. And this is the key element in getting the bootstrap going. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Percy. Any yeah. Questions? If you go back to equation twenty-two. The you have these two evolutions, yeah. Call them the easy one and the third, third yeah. The real, and you found an intertwining, yeah. Double in there, yeah. Now, if the limit on 19 does exist, as, yeah. as you prove, I'm sure, yeah, then you do have an intertwining, yeah. But you could have one, even if the limit didn't exist, there are. At least for nonlinear evolutions, you can do that. Tell you an example later. I'm wondering. Can you just repeat what you're saying for? Yeah. So there is, if you have these two evolutions, you're looking for an intertwining. One way of getting that is to compute this matter way. Yeah. 
Yeah. But maybe the moment better way of a dust in axis. Okay. Maybe dust in axis. Okay. Maybe. You can right. still find the W yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Where we do it point two. I wonder if in the case, in the dark case, in the very spot, negative C. Yeah. In that case, you could find some yeah. W the insert points, what you yeah. call the simple yeah. root and the other one. Even if that really didn't exist. Okay, so uh, that's exactly what we would like to know, right? Is that uh, uh, I would hope there is such a thing, but I have no idea of actually how to how I mean, to. I know one example. So yeah. You take the Boltzmann equation. Okay. There, you, this is nonlinear. Yeah. The actual evolution is nonlinear. The other one is the linearized one. You have to split your space into two subspaces. In one subspace, you take the linear and t goes to plus infinity, and yeah. the other one when it goes to minus. Yeah. You put those two things together, yeah. and then you get an infinite point. This is just one example. Yeah. I'm saying that yeah. it should be, it could be. Some cases where you do find 22, even if you don't have 19. Yeah, yeah, I actually know that. I remember in, in quantum, quantum mechanics um, showing it, it proved it, but maybe. Okay. Um, uh, so I really want to just, I'm really bothered by this problem, C, C negative. It is so unlike anything. Uh, uh, can one think of a, a dynamical system, a finite dimensional dynamic, which has this ability? of just bringing all the particles together. What would do that? And um, hopefully that system is integrable and it approximates what we're actually seeing for long times. Um, you may want to go back to Juan Carré. Yeah. I mean, the equation 22 is actually, I mean, this, this interplane yeah. is what Juan Carré was looking for. He may even have some examples there. Yeah. I mean, the one who really repopularized was Ed, Ed Nelson. He used it to prove uh, a variety of things. Uh, uh, yeah. I'd like to make a comment. No. Percy. Yeah. I can't agree with you. What? But we've had, maybe you remember, I agree with that discussion. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with the correctness of everything you said. Yeah. But there's something you didn't say, which you admitted, which was mm. essential. Yeah. And that is, what is a duck? You didn't define the duck. Or at least you defined the duck in a way that fulfilled uh, the criteria. But it was not in a way that defined the qualitative behavior of integral systems. I, I don't think one had to actually specify the species of duck. No, no, but, uh, <laughs> so all as long as it looks so like a duck. What your duck said. Yes. Yeah. I perfectly understand what Moser meant. Yeah. I've heard that story yeah. before, and I know other versions of it. And he's right. It doesn't mean every system is integral, yeah. but it means that you can give for a particle system, you can give very simple criteria, which give you a maximal set of commuting invariants. Mm -hmm. And that is true. I mean, this was pointed out to me, Laura, mm -hmm. by uh, Michael Eisenman and other people. You, if you have asymptotic velocities yeah. in a system, if the forces drop off fast enough yeah. that all particles have an asymptotic velocity, yeah. that can be used as a coordinate on the phase space, and they all want some commute. End of story. So there's nothing special about Kalajar Moser in the fact that it's got a mass. Kalajar Moser, I didn't say Kalajar Moser. No, I know. I'm, I'm saying uh, Eisenman's example was Kalajar Moser. Yeah. But the same argument applies to Toda. If it's, yeah. if it's open yeah. and if things can fly off to infinity of course. and have asymptotic velocity. So if you have asymptotic velocity, you always have, and that's what Moser meant, undoubtedly, you always have a maximum set of commuting invariants. Does not mean that Mugel Arnold is obeyed because it's not a compact phase space. You have to, in order to, to have action angle variables, you have to have a compact phase space. You don't, if you have asymptotic, you don't. But you do have action angle variables. No, if you if you got an open space space. You, you, you have action angles. No, no, but action angle variables, you, you, you have. 
But do you mean angle, really yeah. angle, compact? Oh, well, you, the general theorem, the Liouville on Arnold theorem says that if you look, if you've got commuting integrals, then the compact. No, 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 no. That's oh, yes. the, no, that's, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. That's not what his theorem. His theorem says that you will then have, uh, you have then got what your system looks like. It's a interval in R n, which is the region for the uh, for the actions, but the rest is a product of lines and circles. That's the theorem. The theorem of circles. Follows if you put in, and that's in this book. Maybe the if theorem of so, if you put in the assumption. Look at the Moses. Level set look at comes. Moses' book together with Eddie Zender. We won't argue about. I mean, you argue about yeah. we'll talk about uh, it. It, it hasn't got to be uh, circles. I mean, uh, the, the theorem doesn't have to. But then it isn't action angle variables. So that's use of words. I mean, it's. <laughs> that's just no, use I mean, of words. It means compact. It means a product. No, no, it's. Uh, it's obvious that you are. Right, I'm not going to. I don't okay. want to pursue it further, but the but essential the one thing to prove uh, the linearization mm -hmm. is that all of the flows are complete and they can be completed in a non compact space, then you don't have angle variables. But if it's compact, they are necessary. And that, then, uh, that I wouldn't argue with, but it's why, why restrict yourself to the com com compact case? It's just what you built, what uh, Arnold did. That's his theorem. Well, it's not what Moses did. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, but uh, it, but there is a, that. if you really want to see the ducks in action, mm -hmm. there, if you go to Mem Memphis, there is a famous old hotel there called the Peacock Hotel. And they have there in the Peacock Hotel, which is a fan, 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 they've got a family of ducks real ducks and once a day these ducks come down and there's the duck parade and the ducks come out and go into a little pool and splash around and that's the duck parade okay so i have a question uh, is there um so you want to go from c positive to c negative yeah is it possible at all to move into the complex c plane and study an intensity of this I've, I've tried i've tried the different things i have not made progress with that i have not made progress i mean i really think that there is really something to be learned here um there's really something new here by the way, your negative C criteria prevents everything from flying to the Of course, exactly. of course. So that doesn't fulfill the Moser criteria. <laughs> I didn't claim that this is similar. Right? I'm not making any claims that I'm not making. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. this oh. the, the, the remark is there something special uh, special about the uh, Lots of in this case. Does it, uh, does it look natural? It's, it's a natural. good question. I don't, I don't, I don't know. So, uh, so we have the situation. If you think about the to total flow, right? Uh, in Q one, right? Okay. Let me just go right back to the very beginning. Uh, Q one. This is the free total. To to so you've got that. Q, uh, Q1 dot, uh, where was it? Uh, no, this is not here yet. This is the flow. There it is. Um, Q1 dot or P, uh, P1 dot is equal to minus Q. So P1 dot is never zero. Yeah. So the total system is a system which shows that this condition here is not necessary to have a lax pen. Can how to put these ideas together? What is really going on that you have a system which has an equilibrium point? Why is that important? Uh, and why is it not important? It's, um, I think that this is a, a wonderful example and really needs to be put in a more uh, more abstracted frame, uh, framework to see what is really why is it that uh, just because there's a, one equilibrium point that tells you that you can put in lax people it's not a useful lax form but that uh, you know 
that uh, puts to the test the idea of trying to say uh, that lax pair is a central idea. I mean, um, uh, 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 Manakov in his proof that that particular top that he was interested in was integral, he, he emphasized that it wasn't enough to have just a lax pair. You had to have a lax pair depending on a parameter or something like that. You need additional structure. But as far as I understand, there's been no definitive theorem of saying if a system has a lax pair and X, then you can use it to integrate the, the problem. Right, just say it very primitive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have a finite lax matrix with no spectral parameter of dimension R, you've only got R commuting variance, and your phase space might be R squared dimension. Yeah, but so that doesn't make it integral. No. As you said, the Euler equations for an asymmetric Tom have a lax pair, but yeah. it's not integral. Yeah. But uh, so you have to have either the loop parameter or some extra information yeah. which guarantees you have yeah. maximums. I think we're both agreeing that you need something extra. And what I'm saying is that, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever been able to pin that down. What that extra thing is that you need to make uh, to make it work. Uh, so. Uh, and so this pro problem just adding on a C to the, really raises all kinds of very interesting. But does that have a, a lax pair with the C? Yeah. yeah. Uh, with a maximal set of invariants? It's got, that's exactly what's done. You can, as I said right at the end, you can just import the lax pair using this wave operator. Onto the full full system, so it's got a lax pair. It was an infinite. It's an infinite. No, it's a finite, a finite number of particles, okay. a finite lax pair, right. as many invariants as the dimension right. of the right. uh, configuration space, yeah. and it's not integral. Yeah, no, it is integral. Oh, it is integral. We've found it since then. It's not of the generic type that the Moser was referring to. Uh, well, it, uh, when C is uh, positive, it is, because, it, it, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, uh, I'm open to any suggestions, any ideas, and uh, if it, uh, some people think as uh, when you should be looking at synchronous systems, there are systems which arise in electrical engineering, things like this, so synchronous systems, and maybe one of them is what is really going on here. But I, I thought this observation of, um, of these three guys that I mentioned, how they understood uh, Fermi, Pastor Ulam, and Tsitsinga, I thought that was a great insight of theirs. It's, uh, um, yeah. Can I make a crazy suggestion? Sure. I mean, as long as we're doing some of these more things, yeah. can you make C the function of time? Does it make sense to do that in there and oscillate between one and minus one? Mm -hmm. Maybe for some case, see, you may get some big picture. I'm sure one will get all kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure one will get some Okay. The energy of the it's an order of the system. Yeah, I mean, when you say, uh, when you say crazy, do you want the Marx Brothers or WC Fields? Which which one do you want? Okay. Okay. So, let's thank the speaker.